creating a new, uh, a new way for creators to monetize their work. And that really flows in nicely to NFT royalty payments. And that's why I spent some spare time uh, trying to build out this NFT royalty standard. So I, I particularly like this XKCD comic. It's about how standards proliferate. And in many cases, there's like, okay, there's 14 competing standards. And then some, some smart aleck comes along and says, yo, I'm going to create a new standard to universally unify all of these into one. Um, and then you've got 15 competing standards. Uh, so we kind of did go down that route uh, originally. But um, definitely, we've found that we're converging on some solid ideas. Uh, the community's really put a lot of work in here. And that's what I'm going to talk to you today about. But first, um, what do I want you to walk away with today? Well, there's three things. Um, the first one is I want you to have a better working knowledge of what um, the royalty landscape today in the NFTs looks like and how we can do better and how it's not great. Um, number two, I want to have you get an idea about how it's evolving, the ideas that we're converging on. and how it's definitely a step in the right direction. Um, and then kind of how, how can you be part of that evolving future? And that's really, um, you know, spoiler alert, it's implementing EIP 2981 into your ERC 721 contracts or 1155 contracts. And it's really, it's really easy. I was originally going to talk about the rationale of the EIP 2981 today, but I kind of changed the talk um, pretty last minute on more of the context around NFT royalties, because I really think in the long run, if I talk about that, it will actually be more persuasive to get product managers, engineers, everyone in this room building something to actually want to implement the EIP 2981 into their NFT projects. <clears throat> so a little context, kind of back of the envelope calculation here. I took two um, collections off of a large marketplace uh, looked at the volume and then done a quick calculation on kind of the amount of money we're talking about here for some collections. So you can see one of the creators, um, and this is probably an outdated number, there's $30, $30 million in just NFT royalties alone. Um, now that's, it's important for, you know, large creators to also get their payments, but also, you know, arguably even more important for smaller NFT creators to be able to extract their, um, their payments. Um, so the goal here is to make sure that the royalty market isn't fragmented with respect to royalty payments and that people do get the payments that they're, they're owed and deserved. Right, so let me set the scene. Uh, we've got five kind of actors in this scenario and I'm going to describe what the current NFT royalty landscape looks like. Um, not in every case, but this is a kind of common case. So we've got Alice, Bob and Charlie and then two marketplaces. Alice is an NFT creator. She mints her NFT on, say, the Ethereum mainnet, and she lists it on Marketplace One. Um, in doing so, she's also set up royalty information for those, that NFT collection. And um, Marketplace One takes that information and puts it into some centralized database, SQL, NoSQL, uh, what, 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 what have you. Bob likes the art, as we all do. Um, and he purchases the NFT. Uh, this is recorded as a sale event on the marketplace side, and the Alice gets her royalty payment. So um, the, that'll be some percentage of the total sale amount, and that'll go into her Ethereum wallet. Sometimes this is kind of asynchronous, it's batched payments, which is great. So <clears throat> Bob realizes that he can make a profit here, uh, and he lists the same NFT on Marketplace too. Uh, the problem here is that Alice, okay, this is kind of unbeknownst to Alice, so she never set up royalty information on Marketplace 2 for this NFT collection. So Marketplace 2 is just going to facilitate that trade, but um, when Charlie buys this NFT, Marketplace 2 doesn't know who to send the royalties to, so there might be some platform cut, but Alice ultimately won't get paid her royalties. Um, which she, which she, which she should, um, and this you're starting to see the the bigger picture here, which is siloed royalty information. 
um, it's uh, it's fragmented, and the idea that we want to move towards is to remove this fragmentation and silos. So just the things that jump out, siloed information. Uh, if it, if she did put it across marketplaces, it might be duplicated and inherently inconsistent. She might have, uh, you know, had a fat finger moment and typed the wrong uh, numbers in for another marketplace and received less royalties. There's no real accountability for marketplaces to uh, pay these royalties because um, a lot of this information is opaque. And just all in all, it's kind of confusing and painful to manage. Okay, so number two, this is where we're converging on. So the ideas here are um, what the evolving landscape looks like. So from a high level, um, we want to basically move that royalty information from these databases and we want to put them into our on-chain in a gas-efficient way. And you'll find out we've, we've actually come up with some really good methods to do this. Um, and in addition to that, we want to have, an, uh, we kind of want to democratize that data and we've built a royalty registry and this is really in collaboration and Manifold uh, XYZ, they built this royalty registry in collaboration with all these um, other large marketplaces like OpenSea, Nifty Gateway, Rarible, Foundation, Zora. And this is one of the first times we've kind of seen all of these marketplaces come together and agree that this is a problem in the NFT space. Um, so there's already been a lot of great buy-in here. And, uh, th this is kind of governed by a Gnosis safe. And I think that um, the more people sort of catch on to this and start realizing that this is the way the royalties information should be managed, uh, you'll see this kind of like thought, and I, I like to call it death of siloed royalties by a thousand cuts. If you, if you get your NFT creators to opt into this model, um, it kind of twists the arm of large marketplaces to start accepting this as the, the gold standard for how they read royalty information. So I want to talk about the royalty registry in particular and why, why it's great, basically. So it's a, it's a bunch of on-chain smart contracts. Um, it's, bon it's deployed on a bunch of different uh, roll-ups. It's mainnet, Robson, Ring B, Polygon. Um, and NFTs that exist on those chains will have their own version of the royalty registry. The idea here is that you would ask the royalty registry for the royalty information for a given NFT. So you, you can imagine the three parameters there. You'd have the contract address, the token ID, and the seal price. So the reason the seal price is passed into the royalty registry is because uh, we get the smart contracts to perform a percentage calculation on that seal price. So the result of the percentage calculation is undisputable. You can't argue with it. So I guess if we're going to move towards this new way to represent royalty information, I've kind of identified three key flows here and the three key actors that are going to have to change their behaviors for us to realize this. So first one is NFT creators circa 2019. So this is kind of like before this NFT royalty standard, um, before we thought about NFT royalties on chain. Then we've got new NFT creators circa 2022 and marketplaces. So they're the kind of three people I think we need to um, get buy-in from here. Flow one is really just about supporting older NFTs. Um, so again, Manifold have created an amazing way to do this. So if you've already created an NFT collection and you want to opt in here, well, they've basically made it like a, a very gas efficient way of deploying royalty information for your NFTs on chain, and it uses something called um, EIP 1167, which is a minimal proxy contract. So it'd be basically, you are able to deploy tiny amounts of code on chain, and then just some the necessary information, and then your NFTs can make use of um, this this open royalty democratization of data. So definitely check that out if you've already made NFTs and you want to get your NFTs registered in the royalty registry. This defaults to using uh, EIP-2981, which is the royalty standard. 
Flow 2 um, is supporting your NFTs. And this one's like really simple. So when you're writing your 721 or 1155 contract, just um, implement a new interface. And this is the, the royalty standard in essence. It's really simple. Um, <coughs> I can talk about the function signature here. Basically, it takes a token ID and a sale price, and it returns the, an address and an amount. The address is who gets it, the amount is how much they get. And that's why the percentage calculation actually happens on chain. You can see that this is a view function, so it's free to invoke. So you don't have to penny information or pe penny gas or anything to actually um, make use of this. So the royalty registry invocations are free for marketplaces. This, uh, this is like the call site of um, the royalty registry, and it defaults to EIP-2981. So if you take away anything here, it's uh, if you want to make if you want to get involved in the royalty registry, add EIP-2981 to your smart contract because it defaults to checking for this, which is really useful, really useful. This is uh, an example implementation of the function itself. Um, and I would imagine most use cases are going to look very much like this, uh, like 99%. So uh, you'll notice here that I do the multiplication first. Uh, that's just a kind of quirk of solidity. Um, it keeps the precision. If you had done the division first, then you would have lost some precision. But Essentially, this returns the two values. It's the who gets it and how much. Um, and it's also at the token level. You can have it at the global level. So all NFTs under the smart contract can have the same royalties, or you can have um, per token. So that, that's useful as well. The final flow was how would marketplaces really have to change their behavior? And I, I can kind of see this as a phased rollout. You know, they were not going to switch over to the to the registry straight away because I can't imagine everybody, you know, getting their NFTs involved in this registry from the get-go. But um, they should definitely integrate with the registry as soon as possible, and you know, make an invocation to the registry, check if the NFT royalty information is there. If it is, use it. If it isn't, then maybe go back to the database and see if it's there. This would just be a matter of, you wouldn't actually have to use like a REST API for anything. By the way, it's just a matter of normal, you know, using Infura to invoke a smart contract function, something as simple as that. I guess, uh, you know, this was one of the final points then. It's like, how do you opt in? I've kind of already alluded to it. It's just implement EIP 2981 in your contracts. Um, I've given a, a, a longer, talk on you know the rationale behind the ip one how long we were kind of discussing this on github discussions it went on for a year and a half um you know it got really down to the fine details of grammar and sentences which was kind of painful at points but um this youtube video is a good overview of uh of kind of if you're a, de a developer or a product person kind of like looking to put this into your project and yeah, there's some solid reference implementations to, to use out, out the gate. Summary of EIP-2981. Uh, you know, the re receive address is a single address. So some people might be like, well, why isn't it an array? Uh, well, it could have been, but we were kind of like wanting to keep it as simple as possible because you can always use that single address as a contract. Open Zeppelin have some nice libraries for this, a payment splitter library, so you can have the address be a contract, and then it's got like a pull payment method, so um, that's that's really great. Um, again, the calculations done on chain, so it's undisputable. We don't define the units of the seal, um, and this is kind of for flexibility. It could be a future EIP, um, and. This is like it's an optional kind of opt in model here, and we we did talk a lot about in the discussions of this EIP. You know, how do we enforce royalties? Because like we're all here because like blockchain's great, and we can uh, you know codify things and make sure the rules get enforced and people should get their payments. But um, kind of some of the standards that came before, uh, i.e., EIP seven two one, 
the the ETH or token for the seal never touches the contract. And in that, you, you can never really tell if it was a simple transfer event or if it was an actual seal. So they're indistinguishable. A seal is just kind of like an abstraction that a marketplace uses to denote a transfer event. So if a, a transfer could be a, a person consolidating their NFTs to their cold wallet, um, and we wouldn't know if that was a seal or not. So there was a lot of kind of uh, hassle and um, really great discussions around like enforcing royalty payments, but we believe that the opt-in model along with more transparent reporting of sale events can hold marketplaces and people accountable to pay these things. <coughs> so th this, is, this is kind of like a call to action, I suppose. So um, everyone kind of sitting in this room, uh, watching online, uh, those of you who are engineers, product managers, anybody building anything relating to NFTs, just uh, spread the word, implement EIP 2981, um, and if there's any marketplaces in the room today, be great to have a chat with you guys uh, around you know, adding this to your kind of phased uh, rollout of royalties. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, that's NFT royalties.